thing is that Prof. Japon was my senior at Presec. So audience, Prof. Japon, Prof. Japon, your audience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice Chancellor. Yes, Professor Bill Poplampo and I shared a room in Kwansan House in Presec. Uh, when I was in lower six, he was in form five. So uh, one year is not small thing. Eh? So, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think it's it's a for me it's a privilege to be here, and I want to commend uh, the Central University for this initiative, for creating the public space for engagement on issues of importance to the country. I before I came. It was yesterday or the day before I went online and listened to the lecture by the government statistician. Uh, and I, I found it very, very interesting and uh, very heavy on the statistical side. So I, I was trying to seek guidance on how to approach this. Uh, I know. I can come and talk about all the genetic epidemiology and uh, T cells and uh, the humoral immunity and all that. But uh, since it is a public lecture, I want to engage the public. So I'll try to make it as simple as one can understand without necessarily losing the import of, of the message. Uh, so the reason why we are here today is to discuss the issue of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, whether we're really out of the woods. And uh, if not, what should we be doing? Uh, my lecture would try to discuss issues on what the pandemic is, how our response has been so far, the importance of the non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions, the vaccination drive, the current status of the uh, Ghana infection and the new global wave, and uh, see whether we are really, really out of the woods, giving the impression that uh, many people took away on the 27th of uh, March after the fellow Ghanaian speech uh, and uh, tried to proffer some way forward. I like to issue disclaimers. Uh, even as I try to talk about what is likely to happen, I want to say that I'm not a prophet, nor a soothsayer. I'm only trying to understand data to uh, engage with the data and see how we can all uh, keep safe. Uh, nor am I a, a, a doomsayer of any kind. Uh, so please bear this in mind. What has the pandemic, I mean, well, first of all, when we talk about pandemics, what, what are we talking about? Pandemics are epidemics of global uh, nature. So uh, in the typical epidemiology class, you teach what an outbreak of a disease is, when it becomes an epidemic, and when it becomes a pandemic. Uh, so when the number of infections of a certain known disease uh, become higher than usual, uh, then one begins to worry. Uh, when it is very high within a circumscribed area, 
you may talk of an outbreak. Uh, beyond that, within a limited geographical region, you may talk of an epidemic. And of course, when it becomes global, then we talk of a pandemic. Um, in my lifetime, uh, this is the only pandemic I have seen or witnessed. Uh, but a lot is said about the uh, Spanish flu in 1918, where we lost over 100 million people. Uh, and uh, even that is sometimes perceived to be an underestimate because the method of counting those days were not as robust as we have now. But beyond that, there are some epidemics of importance which all of us would want to uh, address our minds to. We remember SARS, we remember H1N1, and uh, we remember the Ebola uh, within the West African sub region, and now the uh, COVID 19. I'm not going to a biology class, but let's say that. That there are many coronaviruses. There are many, many coronaviruses. The one of importance that we are looking at here is the SARS-CoV-2, uh, which can cause uh, respiratory disease. And uh, it can be a very simple uh, flu-like illness depending on your level of immunity. And uh, the modes of transmission are well documented. It can be from animals to, to the humans, as is suspected to have happened in China. But for a sustained pandemic, we must have human-to-human uh, -human transmission. That is why uh, droplet infections has been the main route of transmission. The others just keeps the picture complete. But the main route of transmission of, of, of concern is the, the droplets. Uh, so I sneeze around, and uh, the particles are in the air for a while, and then you breathe them in, and uh, some of it lands on my hands, and then I shake you, and. Uh, then we keep it going. That is, that is how it is. There, again, a very simple pathophysiology. So let's look at three key areas. What I'll call the early infection, then the pulmonary phase, and then the phase that nobody wants to get into, where people end up at UGMC or the other hospitals that have become very popular in recent times. Many people will go through the early stage of infection, and depending on your level of uh, immunity, your ability to fight infection, you overcome it there. At worst, you get a flu, uh, you have a fever of a sort, and uh, you take some paracetamol, you sleep a bit, and then you are up and going. But when you move into the third phase, where you have the hyperinflammatory reactions, uh, then it becomes quite serious. And nobody wants to get into that. We have a situation where, because many people have the slight symptoms of fever and flu, which most uh, infectious infections can 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 present um, we do not necessarily think that we have uh, COVID and may not report to the health facility so there are lots of people who may get exposed but may not exhibit all the signs and symptoms to present themselves for testing. As a result, there is a lot of infection which is not 
detected or reported within the community. Uh, and again, depending on how efficient your testing regime is, the more you test, the more you find. So if you don't want trouble, don't test. <laughs> so the, the more you test, the more you find. Uh, so it is like the iceberg analogy. Uh, a lot of it is hidden because it is what you may call the low-grade kind of thing. I'll bring this up at the end of the lecture because it is important for our survival in this environment. The Sub-Saharan African uh, disease pattern and uh, history is very well documented. Uh, from China, the first cases were reported and then WHO declared a, a SARS-CoV-2 as a, a disease of international interest. And then we got our first report in, in Africa, in Nigeria, and then you go on and on and on and on, and today we have everywhere. Um, I think what we need to understand is that when this disease broke or emerged, many people spelled doom for Africa. There were many publications. Uh, Dr. Shannon Smith, a very renowned uh, scientist who is based at the African Center for Strategic Research Studies in Washington, uh, published a lot. And she said that given the fragile public health systems and uh, uh, the close ties to China, Africa is vulnerable to the spread of the coronavirus highlighting the country's centrality to the global uh, health security threats. And uh, if you read her, her papers carefully, she was basically predicting that Africa was going to be wiped away. Uh, if you read uh, other publications, uh, the Mail said 3 million uh, people could die from coronavirus in Africa unless the spread is contained, uh, UN reports warns. Uh, as WHO officials say, the continent uh, could be the next uh, COVID epicenter. That is when issues started to emerge in China and uh, things were basically coming to a standstill. There were many more that we, therefore we should anticipate that in Africa, a high incidence of severe forms of COVID will occur in the younger patients because the demographics and associated uh, endemic conditions that uh, affect the immune system. Uh, we have so many illnesses in our environment. Uh, we have very poor immune systems. And therefore, the expectation was that we will be wiped away. Again, uh, the BBC reports that in Africa, we may not see the same narrative as will be in other places where uh, most people who get it will be fine. That scenario will not play out in Africa. Uh, and then, WHO did uh, together with the UN, the general UN body, did a report on the impact, the potential impact of, of COVID on Africa. Now not talking about disease, but talking about social and economic impact. Uh, they were looking at the, uh, the direct effect on the economy. They were looking at the fiscal space. Uh, they were looking at uh, how it was going to affect uh, unemployment, and uh, the general impact on the economy on Africa was basically spelling doom. And at this point, I want to tell you that don't ask me any questions about this because I'm not an economist. But it was predicted. And uh, 
Today, we are seeing the effects. Uh, depending on which side of the fence you stand, you blame all our challenges on COVID. And depending on uh, the other side, would also say that it's as a result of something else but not COVID. But uh, I, I cannot tell you which one it is. What I can tell you is that we've had COVID. It was predicted that we're going to have a very difficult scenario as far as our economy was concerned, and that seems to be playing out. These predictions were based on the fact that we had profound health challenges in general, and that we had not managed to manage our HIV AIDS, our malaria, and TB, and other infectious diseases as well as one would have expected. Uh, and therefore, the expectation was that uh, this was going to spell doom, especially when we were working within the weak economies in Africa, and of course, the perceived leadership challenges. So, so far, we have not been wiped away. And uh, people have been asking, why haven't we been wiped away? Uh, there are some hypotheses out there. Some thought that uh, the, the genetic, the viral genetic material or variations that were uh, infecting us in Africa was probably different. But so far, there is no evidence all the genetic epidemiological data that we've all collected and put in the same bank that is being analyzed shows that it's the same viruses we are dealing with. Then people say, well, maybe there is a genetic human variation. In, so maybe the people in China are different from us. Uh, we are yet to find that. And uh, again, that is not very likely. Then some say that, well, maybe we have a, a younger population which is stronger. It's potentially true population. And uh, you would realize that many of the people who died in very large numbers in Europe uh, and the Americas were the aged, especially those who were living in these uh, uh, nursing homes. I mean, it was, it was a a very big disaster. Uh, maybe we are not privileged to have our, our population growing to that uh, age, so we cannot tell. Uh, and then there was some who were saying that maybe there was some cross protection from malaria, because almost everybody in this room has had malaria before, if not three or four times more. Uh, so probably there is some cross-protection. Uh, well, I haven't seen any specific data as far as that is concerned, even though it is possible. And then also, there was the speculation about the way ivermectin has been used in Africa over the last 20 years. Widespread use of ivermectin for lymphatic filariasis and onchocercosis all over Africa. And uh, there was the believe that that could also uh, have provided us with some protection. It's possible. But I think that it is probably due to the cross-protection uh, we are getting from immunity that uh, probably we are, we've had by being exposed to many other coronaviruses in the past. And the general tolerance that we have developed to uh, infections in general. I mean, if you live in Accra, uh, the number of infections that will bombard you before you grew as a child, it's... So you probably have built some immunity. Anyway, we do not have the answer to it all. But so far, it appears we have been lucky. But I would say that we should be very careful we need to improve our health system and infrastructure because the next time we may not be lucky. There might be something that we may not be able to fight. 
Now let's look at the Ghana specific scenario. We had our first case on the 12th of March, 2020. And since then, we've had four major waves. And each of these waves have been driven by some particular variants. The Wuhan variant was the one which came with the first wave. And then we heard of the Alpha and Beta, which came from uh, the UK and uh, South Africa. And then you remember the Delta variant, which came from India, also, I mean, pushed another wave. And the last one, the last wave that we had, was driven by the Omicron variant. And uh, for those of you who are epidemiologically minded, you see the waves. This is just a representation of the number of cases that were uh, sampled to be positive over the period of time from since we started collecting data in the country uh, in March 2020 till May this year. So you see all the spikes. There are supposed to be three colors there, but you can see only two. Uh, the blue one is uh, for, what is that? I can't even see it. So from, picked up from routine uh, surveillance. And then the, the red one is the contact tracing. So if I get infected and I report, and then they pick the virus from me, that is considered as the routine one that has been picked. Then you remember that there was a very active follow-up to trace the people who have, have been in contact with. So that is the contact tracing. The green one is the mandatory quarantine, but it is very small in number, so you may not see it very much. That is for those who came in from outside the country. And uh, this was a lot more in the early stages. Uh, uh, so basically to show you that the numbers have peaked at certain times. There has been uh, some very small attempting to peak somewhere here, uh, but it didn't really go. The one from India, and the last one is the Omicron. Similarly, we tried to represent it by a seven-day moving curve. Uh, it's basically telling you the same thing, but epidemiologists who want to show you this to know, for you to know that we know what we are doing, you know. Yeah. But a good thing is that as a country, we invested in what we call the genetic epidemiology monitoring. So we have count, not countries, centers now doing testing all over the country, uh, including uh, my people in who Ruben is here with, with his team. Uh, but many of you have heard of Noguchi, KCCR, and uh, all, all the centers uh, in the northern sector, um, in the southern belt, in the middle belt, centers were established all over the country. And once uh, infections were picked, we tried to find out what kind of uh, variant it is and how uh, the transmission dynamics are. And we work together as a team. And uh, from this, we learn a lot in informing policy. But suffice it to say that we have had infections across the entire country. But the biggest hotspots have been around Accra, Metro, and Kumasi areas. The Northern Belt hasn't had too much infection. This is looking at population density uh, as far as infection is concerned. Uh, what I'm not too sure about what is going on in Upper East, why the infection uh, rate in Upper East is, you can see a dark blue uh, scenario I've had across the country. It tells you the four main variants that I've talked about over the period of time. Uh, for those who are interested, we can get into the details of this during the question time. But 
what I want you to note here is that if you look at the three epidemic curves that I have presented, you see that the Ghana curve is always a delayed curve compared to the Africa and the global one. Basically, it's imported. So, when the Chinese sneeze, uh, maybe a week or two later, we catch a cold. When the British sneeze, or when the Americans sneeze, maybe two or three weeks later, we catch a cold. So, ours appear to be delayed. Ours is the last one, the yellow one. And uh, that is what worries me. Now we think we are okay, but Europe is sneezing, China is sneezing, the Americas are sneezing. And uh, I pray that we will not catch a cold. But the evidence that is there shows that a couple of months or maybe weeks after they start sneezing, we catch the cold. And the trends are very, very clear. When you look at the various variants that have come, it all follows this pattern. And again, if you want us to have a, a discussion on this, we can do that later on, yeah. so that you can understand it much better. So the key issue here is that infections in Ghana has been dom dominated by the B1138, uh, the Alpha Delta variants, and recently the Omicron, as I explained. That importation has been a major driver of the pandemic in Ghana. That the Ghanaian wave usually follows the global and African waves. And it is important that we note that almost every wave is driven by a new variant. The current wave in China, Australia, the EU, these days when you write EU, you have to add UK because they have left the EU. Eh? Uh, the US and all those places should be of concern to us.